want to welcome you this morning. We have visitors with us today, but we also, good to see everybody here and worshiping the Lord. I hope your heart is ready to, to think about spiritual things. I, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn in your Bible and let's go over to the, the book of James for a moment. And in James chapter 3 is where we're going to study. So I invite you to study along with me. I think if you'll have your Bible open there, I think most of this will be on the screen but I hope it will help you to follow along in your Bible as well and keep track of, of it all. Our topic this morning is two kinds of wisdom. Two kinds of wisdom as we approach the things of God. Think about that for a moment. There are two kinds of wisdom, the Bible says. One is a, a heavenly style wisdom and the other is an earthly or sensual or demonic style of wisdom. That sounds like three different ones right there, but it's all describing the same thing. So we're going to look over here in James. Now James is very practical. He talks a lot about everyday things that involve Christians and why it's so important to follow those things. James writes from this perspective and he gets the heart of a lot of issues. And this is one of those issues. One of those things we need to stop and think about. We all should want to be wise, to have wisdom from above, and when we look in the Bible, what we find out is that wisdom is one of the most important things that we should seek out. According to the book of Proverbs, it kind of says things like that time and time again. Well, you ought to pursue wisdom, therefore get wisdom. It's the principal thing. Get understanding, get wise, understand what you're doing in this life and its consequences and the things associated with it. Now God promises that we can have that wisdom. Now that's one of the things that God says that, that's so unique and it's unique because there are some things that are an if. You know, we may get that, we may not. God may bless us with that, we may not. Wisdom is not one of those things. The Bible says that God is willing to grant us wisdom if we'll ask for it and pursue the courses of things that accomplish that. James chapter 1 at verse 5. If any lacks wisdom... Let him ask God. And he says, matter of fact, that's one thing that you can ask of God, and God will not reproach you for it. He will not upbraid you for it. He'll think that's a wise thing for you to ask for. So <clears throat> we obviously, when we think about God's Word, we want to be good students of God's Word, good teachers of God's Word. We under, I want to understand it well. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to learn more about God's Word. But I, can I tell you something today, whether it's being a teacher of God's Word or a good learner of God's Word, here's something that we all need to stop and think a lot about. And we need to think about how James chapter 3, the, the text where we're looking at this morning, starts. It says, Brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you'd incur a stricter judgment. Now, first off, he's saying... While we need many, many people to teach God's Word, at the same time we need to understand we would come under a stricter judgment if we did that. We'll have to be accountable for that. And part of that is wrapped up in the text that we're studying this morning. James points out that sometimes people think if they learn a lot about the Bible or if they know a lot of Bible information that that automatically qualifies them in some ways, to be wise. As much as that sounds right, it's not quite right. You can learn a lot of Bible information and still be very foolish in your ways because you really don't apply that information and you don't act upon it. It's not a complete measure of wisdom to say, I just know a lot of Bible stuff. I, I, I know you know, how to talk about the Bible. I could get up and teach the Bible. As great a goal as that is, it's still not the, the intended goal. And if you look with me in this chapter, you'll see why I'm saying that. He starts by asking a question. And we need to apply this to ourselves and think. This, again, is very practical, what he'll have to say to us. So his first question is, who is really wise? We might think we're wise. Who is wise? Who does have this understanding? We read in Proverbs to get wise, get understanding. Right here he says, so who is that that's accomplished that? Who is that that we're looking at? <clears throat> he says, the person that is that, that is wise, 
Let him show by good conduct <clears throat> that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. If you have bitter envy or jealousy or self-seeking in your hearts, those kind of things, don't boast and lie against the truth. Now, you've got to think, what did he just say there a moment ago? He said, well, who is it that's really wise? We want to accomplish that. We might think that we're wise, so who is it that's really wise? And he's explaining to us, he said, well, if you have bitter envy against each other, if you have rivalry amongst each other, if you're contentious in your ways, if you're jealous towards others, or he goes on to say, if you're self-seeking in your heart, Self-seeking means that you are self-willed and filled with an ambition <clears throat> to, to accomplish things, which isn't always bad, but that self-seeking is a rivalry and you look with suspicion upon others and you're not happy for them if they're blessed or if they're given a position or placed in a, a good spot in this life. You don't like that. You're jealous of them. You are self-seeking because you are ambitious and you want honors for yourself and you want that respect that another person has and it bothers you that they have it. And then he also says, but if that's true of you, and he's just pointing out a couple of things, if, if that's true of you, and I think that's kind of like an illustration there, if that's true of you, then don't lie against the truth. Don't boast about who you are and what you are and your teaching abilities and things like that. Don't boast and lie against the truth. Now, why would he say that? He's saying it because those things that he listed there, bitter envy, self-seeking in your heart, does that sound like that which you're trying to teach over here? If I'm guilty of bitter envy self-seeking, rivalry, jealousy, and all of that, how can I teach that accurately when that's what I'm displaying in my life? You see, what he's saying is I'm lying against the truth. Here's the truth I'm claiming to believe, but I'm lying against it by not practicing that which it really says. My life is living in contradiction, and there could be a hundred other illustrations of that, but, but that's simply what we're talking about. Bitter envy <clears throat> and self-seeking in your heart. James says, you need to understand something. You may call it wisdom to say, well, I'm this teacher and I've got all this wisdom and I'm so smart and I, I have all these abilities and everything and you just don't understand how smart I am. And uh, all of that, you know, in your heart, and I, I think I'm better than you and all the rest. He says, yeah, but if you had bitter envy and self-seeking, he says, guess what? That wisdom did not come from above. Remember I said there's two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom above and there's the wisdom down from below from Satan's realm. There's the way he thinks <clears throat> and there's the way that God thinks. And he says that kind of wisdom, so-called, probably put quotation marks around it, that kind of wisdom, it didn't come from above. It didn't come from God. It comes from... From below, it comes from the earthly, the sensual, and demonic. We're going to explain those terms in just a moment. For when you have envy, James says, and self-seeking, and when those kind of things exist, what is that going to result in? Okay, let's implant that person or people into the church for a moment. Let's plant into the church some people that are highly envious of each other and just them up anytime they see anybody else get to do something, whether it's say a prayer, lead a song, teach a class, whatever it may be, and, and they just are filled with envy, or they are promoters of themselves and self-seeking and full of it, and that really doesn't describe very many of, uh, of the people of this congregation, but that exists and everything. What do you think will be the result of that in a church when you have that going on? You did have that going on in the church at Corinth, for instance. They were that way. They were those kind of people. And what you had as a result was exactly what James says here. 
confusion and every evil thing. He's not just talking about in life. He's actually talking about within the church. There is confusion. There is disorder. There is a state of disorder and disturbance. Brethren at odds with each other. Brethren having trouble with each other. Lack of unity in the church. Disagreements with each other. Maybe even fights with each other. All of that's breaking out because we don't have the right attitude to start with. And James is saying... When that exists, that's what happens in the church. Do you kind of see that if Satan can implant in the heart of a man jealousy, envy, self-seeking, rivalry, and things like that, when he can get it in one church member's heart, he can disrupt the worship and work of the church. He can disrupt our unity. He can destroy our love for one another. He can overcome you know, come that because he's gotten that into the church and you have a church made up of, of, of confusion and everything else and it's a bad, not just, you know, it's not just a slip up in the order of services. This is real confusion. This is where we're all at odds with each other and, and, and fighting with each other instead of fighting for the cause of Christ. Uh, he talked about these three things, that, that which is earthly, and that which is sensual, and that which is demonic in nature. It's hard to think that that should even be called wisdom, and yet it, it is a form of wisdom. It's kind of the way the world thinks about things, because in the world out here, people are very promotional of themselves. They're out to promote, you know, self is number one. They want a lot of attention. They want a lot of people to see them, and they look that direction. And James is saying you have to understand that exists out there in the world and it can affect us as Christians. That kind of wisdom the devil is trying to influence you to have. And the, this is a sad fact. The more you grow in knowledge, the more he can start to influence you this way. Number one thing, thing that Satan would like to do is keep you ignorant. Keep you ignorant of God's word and and just to where you don't know much about it. But if you're going to be the student of God's word, the next thing he can attack you on is to get you to thinking this way. So you learn a lot about the Bible or you know about the Bible or all of that, but your wisdom, the way you behave, the way you act, the way you conduct yourself does not look that way. He says it can be earthly. That's the direct contrast. He said a minute ago, this kind of wisdom is not from above. It's an earthly wisdom. That means it's motivated by human desires. It's promoted by fleshly ways. We're thinking spiritual. When Paul wrote, I mentioned the Corinthians earlier, when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians, he was talking to them about this. And, and he said, I would like to talk to you spiritually, but I can't because, he says, you are still carnal in your ways. That's fleshly, worldly in the way they thought about things. Paul said, I, I have things I'd like to tell you about, but you don't look at things the way you ought to. I get the impression from the Corinthian church that they were just what James is talking about here. They kind of had an ego problem sometimes. They kind of had this feeling that we know a lot, we prophesy, we tongue speak, we do this, we do that, we have all of this wisdom. And I know that Paul was thankful for that, but Paul tells them in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, for instance, he said, okay, you can, you can know a lot. And he said, knowledge is good, but sometimes knowledge puffs up. Knowledge can make you arrogant. He says, love is what edifies. Look, folks, what good does it do for us to know a lot about the Bible if it doesn't lead us to love and help one another and edify one another and strengthen each other. The goal of God is not make you the smartest Bible student on earth. The goal is to use your abilities in the knowledge of God's word to benefit the church and make it strong and make it steadfast and build us all up spiritually. And, and what we're learning is that this kind of wisdom that he condemns here is a kind of wisdom just all caught up in fleshly ways and thinking that way and what good, you know, how, much, how can I get some attention out of this and how can everybody see me in it all? He says it's sensual because it's governed by your passions. It's governed by your own appetites. If you have envy, if you're promoting self, then that's altogether wrong. It's all about you and that's what sensuality, 
That's the heart of sensuality. The third thing he says about it is it's just downright demonic in its nature. And what he's saying is it's not supernaturally demonic. It's devilish. It's the kind of thing you would expect from the devil. It's the kind of thing the devil would have as his own attitude and the kind of behavior that he would seek to stir up in other people. So that's something we never want happening in the body of Christ. So how do you know whether your wisdom's from above or below? How do you know that you have true wisdom? How, what, what in God's Word shows us this? What do we see in this context about that? Well, <clears throat> again, wisdom is not just about how many Bible facts in my mind can I accumulate. That's good because that's a start. But it's also about how did that lead you to have fruit born in your life, growth in your life, okay? Look at this and look at some of the things that James says that would be a good evidence of heavenly wisdom, all right? John, I'm sorry, James chapter 3 at verse 13. Again, he asked the question, who is wise and understanding among you? So, you hate to think of it this way, but okay, we're in a wisdom contest, all right? We're going to have a wisdom contest. We're going to see who's the wisest among us. So he says, all right, well, if you're over there promoting yourself and all excited about your own talents and bragging about yourself and self-seeking and jealous of others about their talents, he said, then you failed. You lost the talent contest over here of wisdom. But here's some ways that you win this contest, not that it is a contest. He said, you want to prove you're wise? Show me by your good conduct. Do what's right. Live what's right. Practice what's right. Your good conduct would prove to me that you're wise. The fact that you are engaged in, in good works, as he says next, your works would tell me about whether or not you're wise, whether or not you really have been ingrained with God's kind of wisdom. See, he says, your good conduct would show it, your works would show it. We would look at the meekness of your wisdom. Now, do you catch what he's saying there? He's saying sometime we're over here and we're bragging on ourselves and thinking highly of ourselves and calling attention to ourselves and we think we're wise and we think we're smart and we think we're educated. Maybe in some sense we have a lot of information in our minds but he says, if you really understand God's will, it will lead to you being meek, not promotional. You will not be filled with yourself. You'll be filled with humility and meekness. Wisdom will lead you to be a meek, hardworking, good conduct Christian. And we got a little bit more to say about it, but the bottom line is, if you're doing that, you're wise. You're not wise just because you know a lot. You're wise because you do a lot. You live a lot, and you live acceptably before God. Keep listening to Him. The wisdom that's from above. So here again, He has a list of things we should consider. Here's the kind of wisdom that comes from above. Not envy, not strife, not contention, not trouble, but the wisdom that comes from above is found in this qualities. And, and when you read this list, it reminds you of other lists of the Bible, like when it talks about how love behaves in 1 Corinthians 13, or, or how we ought to add to our faith virtue and knowledge and things like that. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, and, and uh, are the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, it reminds you of that list. But he goes down the list and he says, well, if you are really wise from above, what would you be? First off, he said you'd be you'd try to live in purity. Your smarts wouldn't say, I'm smart and educated, and man, I have studied this and I really know my stuff. Your smarts would say, I'm going to try to live as wholesomely and pure as I possibly can. I'm going to be dedicated to God and I'm going to keep my commitments to God. I will be pure from defilement. Secondly, he says you will live in a peaceable way. You will be able to be at peace with others because you will practice the precepts of God's Word that lead to peace. We are told to live and conduct ourselves after things that make for peace. So, 
if my thought is I am accomplishing a lot because, you know, I spout my knowledge here, yonder, and there, I've accomplished nothing. I have to accomplish a peaceable spirit within me. Now, you know, you always have to take what Romans says about this, and it says, you have to live at peace as far as it depends upon you. You know, he, he tells us that you have to understand that you can't force peace upon somebody. You have to be as peaceful as you can be, live peaceably with all, but you can't always make somebody else conduct themselves. But as much as depends on you, be at peace with others. He said another byproduct would be not how smart you are, not how everybody talks about you, not how talented you seem. How gentle are you? How meek are you in your ways? What do you show in regard to your conduct? Are you a gentle person in the way that you deal? That, that, that means more than just, you know, real, you know, uh, never get ruffled or anything like that. It probably includes that. But it also is the idea of, of being equitable and fair, moderate and forbearing with others, that I have those kind of qualities. What about a, a spirit in which I am willing to yield to others? If I'm really wise... I don't, ever, I don't always have to have my way. I understand that sometimes we have responsibilities to conform our ways to others and, and bend, what, not the truth, but bend our rights to others. You have to compromise your own personal feelings and things for the sake of others. You have to be willing to yield. You have to be a person that is filled with mercy. You have to show a spirit of kindness to the afflicted. You want to help. You want to be a benefit to them. You are merciful in your ways, not hard-hearted. Sometimes people get hold of the truth and it makes them as hard as they can become. They become like flint. And that's not always a good thing. I don't don't want to be a piece of stone. Matter of fact, when, I believe it was Ezekiel, when he prophesied of the age of Christianity... And looked ahead to what Christ would bring. He said, God's going to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What does that mean? Not a heart of fleshliness in our conduct. He's saying, you don't want a heart of stone. That's not being a good Christian. To have a heart of stone that builds up this defense. I don't care about anybody or what they think about me and I'm just going to plow through. That's not what you want to be. And nobody needs to be that. Have a merciful heart. Have good fruits in your life, he tells us. Keep in mind now, what are we saying? We're saying every one of those would tell you something about yourself. He would tell you whether you're wise or not. Even then, it's not something to get all, you know, boastful about. But it helps you know in your heart, if I'm trying to live that way, that would show me i am really got the character that God expects me to have and, and to look at it that way. He says you would conduct yourself without partiality. You wouldn't show different spirits to different people. You'd show the same, you know, spirit to all, and and, and you'd have that evenness about your character. And the last of all of that list, he says, you would be without hypocrisy. So in other words, you'll never be the person that wants to practice one thing, one way, live one way one day, and, and do something else another the other day because you're not consistent with your faith and not consistent with your wisdom. All right, well, with all of that in mind, let's listen to the last line of all of this in James chapter 3, verse 18. And I never would have believed I got through this this morning because I always gauge these sermons by how many slides I have, and I had 41 slides, and I said, divide that a minute apiece, and it's just impossible. (laughs) So I just go into it and hope some way or another we get through it. Lo and behold, I got through it. This is the last scripture, and I'm almost a little bit ahead of time. At verse 18, he says, now look, this is his summary of all that he said. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Back to peace again. Because why is he bringing that up so much? Because the other guys with the devilish, demonic, 
earthly, sensual wisdom caused disorder in every evil thing. They created all kinds of situations of rivalry and hard feelings and all the rest. He said, you want to prove you're this person that we're talking about in this text? Then bear the fruit. Now what's the fruit of righteousness? Well, he says, one of the things we need to know about it is, it uses the word twice in that, but he says, it's sown in peace. Why does he say sown, planted? Because in the parable of the sower, for instance, the truth was being planted in human hearts. We're in this text and he's talking about teachers and being a teacher of God's Word. He says, how do you sow God's Word effectively? It's sown in righteousness and it's sown in peace by those who make peace. We're not ever going to have peace with others and in our relationships and in life. It's not going to exist until we have sown in peace our righteousness, and that's the fruit of it. That's what we're striving for. That's what we're trying to achieve with our life so that the goal should be seen there. It is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, you, you, you know, things have changed a lot since I was a young preacher, but there, there was a day in which, you know, preachers talked a lot about, well, I had problems at this church, and I had problems at this church, and I've gone from place to place to place, and we've had splits, and we've had this, and we've had that. And I'm sitting back thinking, that's scarcely a resume in my book. You, you know, if you're just going to, you've got to preach the truth, but if you're going to go from spot to spot and pretty much destroy the local brethren everywhere, that's not exactly what anybody ought to be looking for in a preacher. And it's no badge of honor to say, I've caused trouble. And if we have to cause trouble because people are offended by the truth, okay, that's not causing trouble. You remember, you remember old wicked King Ahab one time told Elijah, he said, when Elijah was coming towards him, he said, are you the one that's troubled? There comes the one that's troubling Israel. And Elijah said, I'm not troubling Israel, I'm telling the truth. And you're the one that's troubling Israel by wickedness. And that's exactly right. And this sermon was not preached with the idea in mind that when we have to stand up for what's right and teach what's right and somebody says, I don't like that, that that somehow or another is our fault. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. What I'm talking about is what James is talking about. We don't want to create disorder with what we do. We don't want to be arrogant about what we do. We don't want to cause confusion by what we do. We want to sow peace. And we want to make peace. And we want to have peace first with God and then with our brethren and then with others. If it's all together, lies within the ability to have it with them. That's a good goal. And it's a goal we should want to accomplish in our lives. It ought to be a great goal for all of us. Earthly wisdom... Sensual wisdom, demonic wisdom, or heavenly wisdom. You make the choice of what you want in this life. But do you seek that which is above or that which is below? That makes all the difference. We're going to sing a song of invitation. One of the best things I think that we can do is we can talk about what God says. I feel like when we slide into demonic, earthly, sensual wisdom, a lot of times we're telling what we think, what we like, what we want. That doesn't have anything to do with serving God. We need to talk about what has the Lord said and encourage and admonish patiently people to come to that knowledge and get them to get there through their own convictions and seeing what's necessary. This morning... We encourage you to follow our Lord, to do what He said to do, to obey the gospel as He taught it, not as man teaches it. When we move from the command of the Lord in Mark 16, 16, where He had told them to preach the gospel and said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, we would have you to know today that you have to obey the gospel that way. He followed it by saying, If you don't believe, you will be condemned. I don't believe he's just even saying don't believe in Jesus. I think he's saying if you don't believe the gospel, you shall be condemned. Think about the way he said that and you see that. 
If you don't believe the gospel, you're under condemnation. If you don't obey the gospel, you'll be under condemnation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, The Lord Jesus is coming back to reap vengeance on those who have obeyed not the gospel and who do not know the Lord. Come on now. We don't want to be in that relationship, in that situation when the Lord comes back. While we stand and sing, if you need to come obey the Lord in baptism, put Him on in your faith, repentance, confession, and then be baptized for the remission of sins this morning. We would encourage you to take that action if you've not done it so that you don't stand condemned before the Lord. We say it in love and we say it with a desire to help you serve God right. While we stand and sing, I'd invite you to come if you need to make that response.